Uh, by way of announcement for uh, starting next week, we, we have a list somewhere uh, before we leave the business meeting. If you're a member, you want to get on that list. And let me just tell you, I want you to get on that list. If you feel led to get on that list. And if you don't feel led, maybe just get on that list and let God lead you in the process. That was a plea. That was a passionate plea. But, uh, but we're going to start the nursery back from uh, two and under. And so if your kid's two and under, we're going to start. Is that right? We're going to start the nursery back next Sunday. Uh, we're starting to get, uh, we've got a lot of babies, got a lot of mamas. And it's tough to juggle kiddos, I understand, and hear the gospel. So uh, we're going to try to offer that starting back next Sunday. So if you would get on that list uh, next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, if you're an ordained man here, meet us back in the fellowship hall or the Family Life Center. I'm not sure where that's going to be. And uh, we're going to have the ordination council. That's going to be from about 4 to 5.30. There'll be about a 30-minute intermission. And then um, we're going to have the ordination service. Uh, I don't know who all is coming, who all is not coming. But I would suggest, this is a suggestion. I have a family that's bigger than everybody in this room. And if they decide to take a notion to come, it will just be packed between y'all and them. And so I would suggest if you want to be at the ordination service get here and and come expecting because it's going to be a special time it's a once in a lifetime thing that happens ordination uh when god uh separates a man now he's already called me and separated me out but this is going to be a public demonstration of that call through ordained men Amen? amen without further ado let's jump into acts chapter 8 for the last two weeks we've been traveling through Acts chapter 8, have we not? And this week we'll draw the curtain closed on this, and next week we'll move into Acts chapter 9. Today is, I told the kids a minute ago, it's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. It's one of my favorite passages. And, and, it, and it wasn't until I heard it preached uh, a long time ago by a pastor, and, uh, and he pointed some stuff out to me that really just illuminated my soul for the gospel, right? And so it's just one of my things we'll see philip meet the ethiopian eunuch and 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 so today you might be thinking well what's so interesting about that lance well if you'll just stick around for a little bit you'll see i like what uh nathaniel said he said come and see when he found jesus amen so why don't you just come and see so if you would stand today and we'll read god's word together we're going to start in verse 26 and we're going to read through the closing of the chapter and it says now an angel of the lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And he says, So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Cadus, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all of her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot when he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in Scripture where he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this? Of whom or of, some, of, of himself or some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. And now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded that the chariot stand still, and both Philip 
And the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. And now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Azotos. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, would you just speak to us today? Lord, would you help us? Would you open our eyes? Would you illuminate this scripture to our hearts? Would it not just be one of my favorite passages after today, Lord, but may others say, wow, I, I really saw something in your word today, Lord. And may uh, we all leave here rejoicing, Father God, that, that you would just speak to us, that you would meet with us out here in, on the backside of, of everywhere, Lord, in, in, in Elmore County. Would you just meet with us, Father God? Would you speak to us? Would you, Lord, would you help us? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you know me, I typically work uh, through a text verse by verse and just lift out some stuff. Not every truth because I don't know every truth. Neither do you. I'll take a little pressure off myself there. But we, we just lift out some truths. The ones that mainly God just really places on my heart. There's a lot of times that there's so much more that even I know there is to be said about a specific passage, but I don't believe that God has it for that day. So today we're going to do that, but we're going to do something a little bit different. You know, typically pastors have, they'll say, well, I've just got three points for you this morning. Bless God. I've got ten little points for y'all this morning. Just ten truths that I want you to write down if you don't have a pen, You've got one if you got a bulletin because one came with it. You know, Miss Sylvia equips y'all for the uh, for the for the preaching of the gospel every week. So we have ten truths. So first, let's just get after it, Amen. Because if we want to have a business meet, we better rock and roll, huh? Okay, let's go. So without further, let's go. Number one, we see right here in the first of the text a purpose man, Amen. We see a purpose man. If you didn't see a purpose man, you say, Lance, I don't know, it's not real clear here. But if you, most of you have been here for the last several weeks and we've seen a purpose man. We've seen a deacon set apart. We've seen Philip not only walk in that calling as a deacon, but he also was raised up. For now he's preaching the gospel everywhere he goes. He got sent from Jerusalem to Samaria. He's bringing the good news, the gospel. He's packaging it to it. And, and men or women are being saved. Philip was a purpose man. Philip was a deacon turned preacher. Like I said, Philip was a faithful man. Philip preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Both men and women were baptized. And that's according to Acts chapter 8 verse 12 which we went through a week or so ago we see philip and we see a man who knows why god placed him on this earth and he's making a difference for the kingdom of heaven and in romans eight twenty eight, it says and we know that all things work together for good to those who love god not to everybody to those who love god and those that are called according to his purpose we manipulate that a lot in america today and we just say well hey everybody's called brother if that was the case, America wouldn't look like it looks. Okay? So we need to be preaching the gospel. We need to be sending missionaries overseas. By the way, you're going to do that next year in June. But we also need to be sending some out right here locally in the highways and the hedges. We are all missionary spokesmen for the gospel if we believe and say that Jesus is Lord. Amen? Everybody nod. Amen. And then in, and in Ecclesiastes 3, one it says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a purpose under heaven. Ecclesiastes 3.17 says, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Everything we do in life has a purpose. It, everything we do in life has a purpose. We see Philip here, and he's, he's on purpose. Job 42.2 says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Did you hear that? I mean, somebody in here needed to hear that this morning because that wasn't in my notes until just a few minutes ago. Every purpose will not be withheld from King Jesus. Amen? I don't care what you think, the cards look stacked against you. If Jesus has declared it, can't nobody else thwart it. Amen? I mean, that's a good spot to say amen. We see here in chapter 8 that Philip knows his purpose and is faithfully walking in it day by day. 
question this morning. What's, what's our purpose? What's your purpose? What's my purpose? What's our purpose here on earth and are we walking in that purpose? Are we walking in it? I mean, because we're, we go through life and sometimes it just seems like it's a mundane day-to-day grind, right? I mean, the, this don't add up, this don't add up, this relationship's messed up, the family over here's jacked up. What's our purpose? Secondly, we see a pleasing heart. We see a pleasing heart. We can see this pleasing heart in the latter part of verse 26 and the first part of 27. Let's read it together. It says, and, uh, it says, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And guess what it says? So he arose and went. He didn't say he counted the cost and said, Lord, I ain't got enough gas money to get down there uh, where you want me to go. Lord, I've only got this one pair of shoes and uh, these shoes ain't fitting for the occasion, so I can't go. Uh, Lord, um, uh, they some rough folks down there towards Gaza. If you remember, if you look back in the Old Testament, it says in Joshua chapter 11 that the land rested from war except in Gath, Gaza and Ashdod. And I'm fixing to go down there and and it's, it's, it's always been kind of a rough place for us Jew boys down there. We don't see any of that. It says that when the angel of the Lord spoke to him, that he arose and went. Man, that's a good word for everybody here, even, even your old pastor this morning. It says uh, Philip had to have a pleasing heart to leave a growing and thriving church in Samaria and want to go down to a desert, amen? I mean, it'd be like, uh, I don't know, just think of somebody. Somebody's got a a thriving ministry, not some mega church on TV, but somebody that you know that's got a good ministry preaching the gospel and God is really blessing and anointing what's going on there. And then he'd come in one day and say, hey, uh, angel of the Lord spoke to me last night while I was sleeping and... uh, I got to go down here to a uh, little old country church. Uh, they got three members finna shut the doors. So God sent me, sent me down there to preach the gospel. That's what that'd be like. And you're not but God on it. You just go. You just say, okay, Lord, I don't really understand what's going on here, but I'm going. And the angel of the Lord told him to go, and it says he arose and went. But how many of us would, would, uh, would like God to just take us and, and do something like that with us, just something totally crazy. Nobody's volunteering for that mission. Nobody's saying, hey, Lord, won't you just make me totally uncomfortable, take me out of my seat of comfort, and you just go put me out here in the wilderness on the backside of a desert somewhere. You just send me down there, and I'm not even knowing why I'm going. You just say, hey, I want you to go down here. Nobody's signing up for that. But we see this faithful man with a servant's heart. He just gets up and he goes. Let me ask you another question this morning. What kind of heart do we have? Is it a pleasing and a willful willful heart? We want to willfully do the will of God. We want to willfully follow His Word. Or is it a murmuring and stubborn heart? I know what mine can be some days when I don't get things my way. I can be a murmur. I know some of you don't struggle with that, so I'll just help you out a little bit. I struggle with that some days. When things aren't going right, when everything keeps falling apart, when things are not adding up, just like some of y'all's weeks been, my weeks are just like yours some days, and I, I murmur a little bit. But no matter what we just told ourselves, God knows the truth, amen? <laughs> so whether you just affirm that or you told a story, God knows the truth, amen, and he already convicted you of it. Third, we see a prepared way. Anybody in here ever trouble, uh, struggle? You never probably have struggled, but you might have struggled, amen? You ever struggle with trusting God, anybody in here? You just struggle to trust God that He knows best. Let, you know, he tells, <laughs> he tells the flowers when to broom. Uh, bloom, broom, I can't even speak today. I told so I text somebody my outline this morning, and he said, man, preach it. And I said, I sure am glad my fingers aren't going to be doing the preaching. Now my fingers have made their way up into my mouth. And I, and I, because I autocorrect got me about 10 times. When you got thumbs this big, it happens. But 
you ever, I mean, just struggle with trusting God. Like maybe, you know, just because he tells the seed to only come this far, and, and Lord, he tells the, the trees when to bloom, and he tells the, the fruit when to get ripe on the vine, like he just might have missed what we have going on. I, I struggle sometimes trusting God. But, but Philip, but <clears throat> you feel like God wants you to do a particular something, but you can't see how in the world you're going to get it done. Lord, I, I, I kind of feel you saying, hey, I want you to do this, but I can't, I, can't, I can't make it add up. Philip had a particular way that he was told to travel. Amen? He didn't say, Philip, uh, there's a desert down there below Jerusalem. I want you to get there the best way you know how. God is a particular God. Amen? He didn't just say, hey, just figure it out. Just figure it out, brother. And if that's where you're at today, you need to stop, cease, and desist. You need to get back to God's Word. You need to let God's Word read you and, and, and let God speak to you. Amen? But he was, he was told a particular way to travel. And, and what if I told you that the, the routine that we do every day and the mundane things of life that we are involved in and we're knitted together in, it's a prepared way. That God, it's a prepared way. I mean, we're not just out here like happenstance. The people you run into, I say it all the time, at the gas station, your co-workers, your family members, it didn't just happenstance. It's, it's, a, it's a specific in a particular way, and God's wanting to do something there. I mean, Lord, help us. But what if God can't do the miraculous in our lives because we're so numb and indifferent because we just live ordinary lives, right? Well, think about when Jesus called the disciples what were they? They were just ordinary men, right? That, I mean, we're fixing to do a study in a couple of weeks by John MacArthur, 12 ordinary men, the disciples. They were just ordinary men. I'm thankful, and I say it all the time, I'll say it again, that in Mark it says, and the common man heard him gladly. Thank God, because that's all I am is a common man. That's all you are. We're all cut from the same cloth, so to speak. But God has something prepared for us. But if you're like me, we miss those assignments because we get distracted sometimes. We just, we just miss the assignments. And Philip was just being ordinary Philip when he was called in to be an, a deacon. When they ordained him that back in Acts a while back. He was just being ordinary Philip. God wants to do something in our ordinary lives. If we think for one second that it's going to take this miraculous thing to happen before God can ever use us, we're going to get to heaven and we are going to be empty heaven. Uh, we're going to be empty handed. Lord, I can't even talk today. It's like I'm having a TIA up here or something. Just lips don't want to work right. But if we're going to get to heaven empty handed. And, and I think there's going to be a lot of sadness in that point in time when we look at Jesus who gave everything he had so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The difference is every opportunity in every setting that he, uh, he was placed in become a mission field. That was the difference between my life some days and Philip's life in this text. Everywhere he went was an opportunity for him to glorify God, to work the mission, to share the gospel. But we get caught up in, 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 in life sometimes. And it's not just bad things. I mean, sometimes it's just, it's just life. Yeah, but it weights us down and we, we lose track of the mission. Fourth, we see a particular person. Verses 28, I mean 27 and 28 will help us with this. And it says, And so he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia. Wow. So wait a minute. He arose and went, and then behold... Amen. So he didn't sit and stagnate and calculate and try to count the costs and all this. What did it say? He arose and went and behold. We're not getting the behold sometimes because we're not arising and going. We're not getting the behold sometimes because we're pinching pennies and counting the cost. Hey, listen, two weeks ago, I didn't have the full amount to go on the mission trip and I just like... The, the public service announcement. I wasn't asking for money. I was just telling y'all about the mission trip. I get back to church that night. Bingo! There's an the envelope on the uh, pulpit. Funded mission trip. Amen. Funded mission trip. I mean, God's not wanting us to count the cost. He's wanting us to arise and get the feet to moving. Because faith meets moving feet. Amen? Amen. 
That's what it does. I, it's a good spot to say amen. I, oh, the journeys God would take us on if He could get these feet of disobedience to moving. I wrote that. I thought it was a good thought this morning. It was If we could just get these feet of disobedience to moving, God could do some miraculous things. God has never laid out His whole plan and said, Lance, what do you think about this? What do you think about this, big boy? I'm going to take you over here. I'm going to do this with you. Matter of fact, we're going to go over here sometime and do this. And this is going to happen. What do you think about that? He's never said that, and he's never said that to you either, because that's not how he works. He gives us enough at a time that we can be faithful to to respond. And when we're faithful to respond, he gives us a little more, gives us a little bigger bite each time. And then we just we carry on. He, he says, go, and, and then we'll see. We'll see the plans of God. We'll see the blessings of God. We'll see the shelter and protection and provision of God. All of these are found in the footsteps of obedience. You hear me? The protection of God, the goodness of God, the fulfillness of God in your life, they're found in the footsteps of obedience. God makes a way while we're on the way. That's when God makes a way, when we're on the way. When, when, the, when the Israelites were going to cross the river Jordan and go over into the promised land, when did God split the Jordan? When did He roll it back up? When the sole of the shoe of the priest hit the water, then He split the water. Not until then. And it wasn't when it was at low tide either. And of course, they didn't deal with the tide. I'm just being funny. It was actually during the portion of the year when it was out of the bank. Some places they said it would be out of the banks up to two miles. God's not going to take us to many creeks and let us across. But He will take us to some big rivers and say, big boy, are you going to trust me? What is it that has you doubting God this morning? Amen? What is it that has you doubting God? It could be that we can't see God's hand moving in our lives because we've been disobedient to the last thing that He said. Like we're not getting any of these aha moments in our life because we was disobedient back here somewhere. Or it's just utter turmoil and chaos because it's going to get so bad before God, we eventually say, I can't take it anymore and I surrender. And I go back to the last thing God said. You go back to that thus says the Lord moment in your life where you quit listening to God and you started figuring things out on your own way. But the particular person is the Ethiopian eunuch, and, 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 and that's what we see here in this person. What, you mean to tell me that God is so personal, Lance, that He would send a man by foot some 70 miles down into a desert to intercept a struggling soul? That's exactly what I'm telling you. That's exactly who God is. He will send you so far out of the way just to speak to one person and we'll be so frustrated. Oh, I got hung by another red light. Oh, I, oh interstate shut down. I'm going to have to get off and go the back roads just so I might could stop at a gas station one morning just so I might see somebody and say a kind word and then maybe share the gospel to them out in the middle of nowhere between here and Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, that's what kind of God I serve. I don't know what kind of God you serve. That's who I serve. If Jesus could leave the throne room in heaven and, and, and leave everything for me, he'll send somebody 70 miles in a desert to speak to an old boy that just went to a worship meeting and missed Jesus. Amen? He went to Jerusalem to worship, but he missed Jesus. But he didn't miss him in the desert. We'll get there. I'm going to run. We're going to have dessert before we're supposed to. Fifth, we see a passage of Scripture. What was this eunuch reading? Well, he was reading Isaiah 53, wasn't he? And man, wow, what a great thing. We, we read a part of Isaiah 53. It's one of the best. I used to love to see the black and white videos of Billy Graham preaching Isaiah 53. Man, it just makes you want to recommit your life every time you see him do it. I, maybe you just need to do it. You need to see it for yourself because some of y'all are not looking in agreement. But when you see Billy Graham preach Isaiah 53, it's like as I'm going to the altar again. Wow, what a particular God that this man would have a parchment of paper reading in the chariot in a, on a road going back down to Ethiopia some 200 miles away. He even placed a particular passage of that Scripture in that man's hand. And to me, it looks like God's trying to do something in this man's life, right? 
I mean, when things just keep happening, I don't look at it as, man, that's just happenstance. I say, no, God's trying to say something here. Lord, help me in my unbelief and help me in all this other stuff that I have going on that I can see what you're saying because you're trying to speak here. Question. What in the name of Jesus is the Holy Spirit trying to do in mind of your life this morning? Because He's going way out of the way to save one man. And I like God the way He works. He, he does some unconventional things, doesn't He? He does it with some unconventional folks in some unconventional circumstances just to get His point across that He's God. If your answer is nothing, then Houston, we got a problem. <laughs> I mean, Houston, we got a problem if your answer is, well, I, nothing. Because He ought to be doing something in each and every one of our lives to some extent. Now, every one of us is in different parts and places in our spiritual walk. But good night, man of God. We ought to be, God ought to be saying and doing something in our life. If He's not speaking to you, open His Bible. He'll speak to you. He speaks to us through His Word. Sixth, we have a perplexing Word. You mean to, what do you mean, Pastor, a perplexing Word? Well, all of God's Word is per- perplexing, is it not? I mean, I don't just sit down and read God's Word and think, oh, I got that. And every time I read it, it seems like I get something different out of the text. God's Word is perplexing. Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. So where does wisdom come from? The Lord. The Lord. That's where wisdom comes from. And if we're getting wisdom from anywhere else, then, man, we do have a problem. If we understand anything in God's Word, it's because God gave us understanding. Verse 36 brings us to number 7. Uh, y'all are like, man, we're never going to get through 10 points. Sometimes he struggles through getting through. Th- and here we are at number 7. Everybody just smile for just a second. Breathe. Take a sigh of relief and say, we, we're not going to burn the beans. But verse 36 brings us to point number 7. A perceiving heart. That's what God can give us is a perceiving heart. See, sometimes when I'm in the flesh, I have a perceiving heart. But you know what it is? It's always trying to, it's always thinking, I wonder what kind of angle they're trying to get on me here. I wonder what kind of plot they're trying to set for me here. You you know, I wonder what these boys are scheming against me. But when Jesus is, is on the throne and I'm off the throne, he gives me a perceiving heart. And I can see through that stuff and I'm not even worried about what they're trying to do because my Bible says a man who digs a pit will fall in it. God's Word don't come back to us void. You can shake your head yeah to that. God's Word don't come back void. It says a man who digs a pit falls in that thing. Guess what then you get to do? You get to be the hand and feet of Jesus and you get to help him out of the pit. (laughs) That's what we get to do. But you you can see the wheels turning and the Holy Spirit at working here. Let's go read verse 36. It says, um, well, let's back up. Yeah, 36. It says, now as they went down the road, they came to some water. What do you mean that he the wheels were turning and they came to some water? Well, Philip had just preached Christ Jesus from Isaiah 53 until this point in life. He just gave him the gospel. He just gave him the fullness of the gospel. And the wheels are turning. And he, this guy, lo and behold, this Ethiopian, found this in my study. And you learn stuff when you study to prepare to preach. This guy was a Jew. He was Jew born. Why was it? Why would he be going to Jerusalem to worship if he wasn't a Jew? You wouldn't be. And this wasn't just one little chariot. This was the man of Ethiopia, which used to be a great country. He had probably, most uh, guys say he had a humongous caravan go. But in verse 36 says, it says, Now as when they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See here is water. You're thinking, wait a minute. They're in the desert. How in the world? We got water. How many many people have ever watched National Geographic? You see the deserts, you don't just, it's not like Lake Jordan's everywhere, right? Lake Martin's. You don't see that. It's a desert. The word here, water, is translated wadi. You know what that means? That means mud hole. You know what? They have flash floods over there. They have rainy seasons and, and, and water are collecting these, what they call wadis, mud holes. And so they, they, he says, see here is wadi. Wadi. 
so we have this perceiving heart. They're, they're rolling down the road and all of a sudden there's a mud hole, right? This man has just went to Jerusalem to worship and he had religion. Now he just got introduced to King Jesus. Relationship. Totally different thing. The religion's what's killing churches in America. And it's the lack of relationships with Jesus Christ. That's, that's why we're not thriving as a church in America, even Elmore County. It's because we lost the relationship for religion. This guy left it and found Jesus because God said, Arise and go. But they're down here and they see this mud hole. Verses 36 and 37 gives us point number eight, a professing believer. A professing believer. Let's read 36 and uh, 37. And it says, And now when they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And the truth is, if you profess Jesus Christ as Lord, nothing hinders you from being baptized. But the, the problem is, is that we know that Philip kind of got burnt on this before, didn't he? Let's just press on a little further. We, we see that we see that this man professed Christ. And in, 30, in 37 it says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is different from Simon the sorcery we saw just a few verses back last Sunday when he leads us to believe that he's... Uh, this, belief, this leads me to believe that, that Philip is growing in his call as a pastor. Amen? Because he didn't just let the guy say a few words and then say, all right, brother, come on down and let's dunk you. He said, if you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, then you can be saved. You can be baptized. He made it a lot clearer. We didn't see that in Simon's baptism. We didn't see that. Not to say that he didn't do it, but he didn't say it, but it does say it here. So we see that the man wants to be crystal clear so that it's not just lip service to God, that it's actually you're just divesting your heart to him and saying, here it is, Lord. Here's everything I got. Amen. In verses 38, we find number nine, a partaker in baptism. Well, let's read 38. And it said, so he commanded the chariot to stand still in both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. If we don't understand what Jesus Christ did for us, all we do when we climb over into a baptismal is to take a public dunking. That's all we do. I took a public bath when I was a child. When I was a child, I, I made a profession of faith because I wanted what I did not have. I wanted what somebody else had. I saw other friends of mine go and make a profession for Christ. And I decided I was going to do the same thing a couple of weeks later. There's a problem though. Jesus had not revealed Himself to me and said, Come. My Bible says and your Bible says that no man comes unto the Father unless the Spirit draw him. But hey, I would say this, well, how is He drawing? Through our testimony. In Revelation it says, and they over, overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. It means we ought to be sharing and telling people what God's done for us. Amen. But when we believe that Jesus Christ came and died so that we may have life, we have a true believer's baptism. A true believer's baptism. You want to know why so many people have left the church? that you grew up with in youth group and we hadn't seen them again, it's not because Jesus isn't faithful. It's not because God's not good. It's not because God's Word's not true. It's because some of them ain't been saved. I'm not that, we can't say all of them, but we got to leave some room for some backslide. Amen? I mean, because there's, back, there, there's backsliding all in this God's Word. But some of them folks ain't saved. That's the reason why you can be raised up in the church your whole life, never come back to church, and it never matter to you. I know that's a hard word, and it ain't very... I mean, that's just not knit gloves, but it's the truth. That's why we ought to share the gospel, and we ought to share our testimony. We ought to share what God's doing with, with everybody, even folks that we think are saved. Because you never know. I mean, I've seen... I saw a church service one time. I was at the fire department. I was watching online. I saw a 70... 
six-year-old deacon come down and get saved one night. And I'm telling you, that place broke out in revival when he said that. Because I guarantee you, because we, you know, we know the little tweets, we know the little birds in the community, we hear the hotline. We know when folks ain't doing right. Sometimes we don't want to call them out on it, but we know when folks ain't doing right. We know when folks is caught up in some, in some mess. And you might can get caught up in some mess for a minute, but like I said last week, you don't stay there. You don't stay there. You might get some mud splashed up out of the puddle on you, but you don't waller in. Baptism is the first act of obedience in a believer's life. <clears throat> in the Iranian church right now, they, they won't even let you associate and say that you're a member of what Jesus Christ is doing in their church until you publicly go down out in public and they baptize you. You don't think that right there don't put a mark on your body for everybody in Iran to see and them say, oh, okay, they want to be Christians? All right, we'll barbecue that whole family tonight. You can't even profess that you're a part of the church until you go down and publicly are baptized. You can't even come to church. They share the gospel with you on the street. You get baptized publicly. Then you can come to church meeting. Totally different here. What about you this morning, church? Have you been baptized? Or is your baptism on the right side of salvation? See, when I, when I, when I profess Christ, it was a little bit of a burr. Was I baptized? Does that work? I professed Christ at 25 years old in 2008. Uh, it was a little confusing for me, but I said, you know what? I, I really genuinely believe that Jesus just saved me today. And I'm going to get baptized and show the world that I believe that Jesus Christ saved me. You're baptized doesn't work on the front side of salvation. It works on the back side because it's obedience. We're, we're identifying with Christ as He went down into the Jordan. Now, there's a lot of controversy, not for me, maybe for you, about you know, sprinkling and different things like this. The word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means when they, the farriers would take, a, or a blacksmith would take a shoe that was red hot that they were going to fit the horse's foot, they would baptize that shoe down in water. Baptizo. They would baptize it and bring it back out and cool it off. You, you're buried with Christ in His death. You're raised with Him in His resurrection to walk in newness of life. Baptizo for me, not sprinkleizo. Just me. In verses 39 and 40 brings us to number 10, a parting of ways. Some of you thought we were never going to get here to the parting of ways, but here we are, verses 39 and 10. It says, Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in, in Asatos, and passing through, he preached all the way to the cities where he came to Caesarea. You know something neat about Philip? Philip's home place was going to be Caesarea. And he kind of set up mission field there. He kind of set up shop. Sometimes God will take us from somewhere in life, and he'll, he'll take us to an unconventional place just so we can do some things, so we can be a part of something, so God can show us who He is so that we don't have to doubt Him and that we can trust Him, we can know His Word is true. And then He, and then he sends Him somewhere else. But you know what? The, I was reading and studying, the largest uh, church used to be in North Africa. Did y'all know that? I believe this unit got glorified, saved. And he went back. And he shared the gospel and a lot of other people got miraculously saved, wonderfully saved, however you want to say it. They got saved. And that church, they had evangelism explosion like they'd never seen before. And folks got right down in Ethiopia. Now it'd be modern day Sudan. Well, what do we know about the Sudan? Well, if, if I'm not mistaken, this past week, the Sudanese people just said they're going to pray, pay uh, reparations back to the United States to getting good graces from because they're getting starved to death right now. You know why? Because I believe they took a step away from God 
and, and they turned their back on God. Now they got all this Muslim garbage over there. And the Christian villagers over there, these Sudanese people, they get raped, burned, and pillaged on a daily basis. But there's still a, there's still, I believe there's still a remnant there of the church that this man started all those years ago. Amen. Ten truths, and we, we made it through it, but, but Philip found his way to Caesarea where he kind of landed the plane in his ministry. How, how about us today, church?